Well, good morning. <clears throat> We're in a series called Marked, and it is uh, an opportunity for some of us on staff to, to share uh, a passage of Scripture, a verse of Scripture that has uh, come to mean a lot to us as individuals. And so Mike did last week, uh, to, this morning it, it, it's my turn, and mine is found in Galatians chapter 6, uh, verse 10. And it says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And now, to, to get the whole picture of, of what this, this verse means, there's a little bit of unpacking that has to happen. So the first nine verses kind of set up the context through, through which you see this, because uh, one of the questions is, is you know, what, what good just nice things? Do we do nice things to people and, and hope that that's enough? Or, or is there a qualifier for good? And that's what we're going to kind of unpack together. But first, I want to <clears throat> remind you of a, of a principle that maybe uh, you, you learned when you were in school. Um, <clears throat> there's this guy, his name was uh, Archimedes, and he was a mathematician, a uh, famous old dead guy. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he was charged with his king to uh, figure out whether or not this, this goldsmith had cheated him. And so uh, he had given gold to this guy to make a crown. He got the crown back, and he just had this feeling that something was wrong. And it wasn't as simple as just weighing that much gold against that much, uh, against the crown and seeing it was balanced. He wanted to find out, did, did I get ripped off? And so he asked uh, Archimedes to figure it out. Well, one day he was getting into the bathtub, and, um, you know, the, your body, when you get in a bathtub, it displaces water and water sloshed out. And that just triggered this series of thoughts in his head. And he, the, the light bulb came on and he got this idea. It, so excited, he jumped up and he began running through the, the streets of the town <clears throat> naked, screaming, Eureka, <clears throat> which is Greek for I found it. <laughs> I wonder what the people in the streets were shouting <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, so anyway, you know, Archimedes didn't invent the principle. He, he just discovered it. Uh, he figured out this whole principle, the relationship of buoyancy to gravity. And he did the whole mathematical equation and formula and stuff. And it's just really complicated. I found one other image on there. Do you, do you have that one? I'm like, yeah, this is, I get this. <laughs> so that, that's, that's my... Uh, a science lesson for you for the day. Well, uh, in the passage that we're looking at uh, in, in chapter 6 of the book of uh, Galatians, uh, there are a few things that are kind of brought to light. Um, Paul wrote this letter to the people of Galatia. It was a Roman providence in Asia Minor. He wrote the letter about 35 years after uh, the ascension of Christ. Uh, the churches were springing up all along the, the coastline, uh, especially there in Asia Minor. And Paul, since he planted uh, churches in that region, sent them a letter uh, to explain to them some of the things relating to Christian growth. Well, in chapter 6 of the letter, uh, Paul is contrasting our responsibility to help people uh, who are in need with the tendency that we sometimes have as human beings to not take responsibility for our own lives. And he's trying to work out some kind of a balance so that they understand. Well, in Galatians chapter 3, uh, Paul writes, If you think you are something when you're nothing, you deceive yourselves. <clears throat> now, Paul didn't write a whole lot of self-help books because he, he didn't have a way of making you feel good about who you were. Uh, he wanted to cut through the, 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 the fluff and just hit you right where you lived. If you think you are something when you are nothing, you deceive yourself. Now, he wasn't trying to beat people up. He was trying to make sure that we understand each of us should test our own actions. As long as you're comparing yourself to those around you, determining uh, your evaluation of how you feel about yourself based on other people and, and their circumstances and situations, you're going to run into problems. You run the risk of deceiving yourself. And once you've deceived yourself and, and thought that your circumstances aren't as acceptable as those that are around you, you can become irresponsible. 
we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. The calling that God puts on our life is, is the standard that we hold. <clears throat> when we uh, compare ourselves to others, we make excuses. We, when we compare ourselves to ourselves, we make progress. Now, that, that sounded really good when I wrote it, but uh, I, I wanted to clarify it because when you compare yourself to others, you make excuses, right? <clears throat> well, I, I can't run as fast as that guy because uh, I've got a bubble in the middle. Uh, I, I, I can't do this because I don't have the resources that that person has. I can't, I can't figure that out. I, I just wasn't good in math or science or <laughs> social studies. Or <laughs> you know, so you start making all these excuses for what's different. Compare yourself to yourself. And I'm like, what? What was I thinking when I wrote that? Here, here's what I mean. Um, when, when you look to your life, and, and since we're talking about faith, we're going to talk about faith stuff. Um, I can remember uh, taking students uh, to like youth conferences or, or a mission trip or something like that. And we would go and we would have this experience. You know, everything was really focused in. It was, it was keen. And, and you got home and you just, man, you felt connected to God. You felt like uh, everything was where it ought to be. And then a week or two or three days later, it was like the bubble burst. And you were dealing with the same old stuff. Compare yourself to yourself. Were you at a spot before where you felt like everything was where it ought to be? You remember a time when you felt connected to God? Well, here's a question. What were you doing during that time when you felt like things were right? What were you doing? And this is where you start inserting answers like, you know, I was probably making time for for God to do stuff. I was, you know, and, and when you take kids on a mission trip, you're like, okay, your cell phone wouldn't work in the desert. Uh, you didn't have internet access. Um, everybody here was on, on task, on point. We'd had devotions together. We prayed together. We got up and we went and accomplished these things together. Everything was pretty regimented and, and the purpose was pretty clear. And it's easy to feel connected when that's the case. But every day isn't a mission trip, right? You have to go to work. You uh, have to answer the phone when you have signal. And things just uh, go back to normal. Each one of us have a load to carry. And Paul says, it's your job to carry your load. It wasn't his way of... of having us forget about other people. Because remember, he was talking about serving people and loving people and taking care of people. But he says, primarily, each of you should carry your own load. It was his way of saying, take responsibility for yourself. You have families, you have financial responsibilities, you have opportunities in this life that are specific to you. Now, I, I want you to realize there are things that you are the most uniquely qualified person to deal with. Situations in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, you are the best answer for that opportunity. And, and we've talked ourselves out of it because we've compared ourselves with other people. Well, no, I think, you know, Mike Tuttle would probably be the best person to ask if you had a question on the Bible. Um, you know, somebody else is going to be the best person to, to deal with this issue because, you know, little old me, it's my birthday. And, and we're, and we're, we're, We've tucked ourselves into a corner and we've talked ourselves out of the stuff that we ought to be holding on to. Verse 7, he bears down pretty hard and says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. God doesn't uh, forget about who we are and, and where we've been and the resources that we've been through. Uh, I, I can remember as a, as a little kid, um, we had a culprit at, at my house. It, it was... Someone who, who did all the bad stuff. You know, who broke the lamp? I don't know. <laughs> she had cookies. My mom had, she bought food for everybody, but she had these, they were pecan sandies, right? I don't even like pecans. 
And I would find them. I, I, I would search out where my mom hid them. I thought it was this game. She would hide her pecan sandies. I remember as a little kid standing on the counter, laid out across the top of the refrigerator, moving things to get into the door to find my mom's cookies. And then she would say, who ate the cookies? I don't know. <laughs> right? It didn't fool her. She understood what was happening. We think sometimes that by doing something nice for somebody else, that, that we've pulled the wool over on, on God. That if he sees me doing something nice for somebody else, that that's going to cover all the bad stuff that I did, and he's going to think that I'm, I'm good. We're going to talk God out of, of what's real in my life based on a few things that I'm doing that's nice. You know, there are environments in your life where you can slough off responsibility and get away with it. But Paul warns the Galatians, God isn't fooled. He knows our hearts. Not just the, the list of things that we've done that are wrong. He knows our heart. He knows what makes us tick. He knows why we've chosen the things that we've chosen. <clears throat> and uh, as we start pursuing him, we find a connection. He gives us principles and precepts in his word. One of them is you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. <clears throat> Life is connected. Where you are today is a result of decisions that you've made in the past. To some of you, that's good news. Others are squirming in their seat, right? I've had people say, you know, well, I, I've been a Christian and, and I've, I've started doing right stuff and I'm trying to make amends for my past, but, you know, I still have these things that just keep popping up. <clears throat> you mean like you planted something in the spring and, and it's starting to grow in the summer? You know, there is this whole connection of reaping and sowing. I think one of the biggest uh, problems that we've had as a culture is we have tried to undo that natural law of that which you sow, you shall also reap. Because we let people do goofy, stupid stuff and then reward them like everybody else who played by the rules. Well, there's a disconnect. I, I've been in grocery stores where I've heard mothers say, if you do that one more time, and it happens, if you do that one more time, if you do that one more, I'm like, you want me to spank them? <laughs> Come on. Let's give some consequences in the world that we're in because these principles that God designs for us are there for a reason. They help us navigate this broken world. And when we ignore the principles, you know, nobody goes out and builds a boat ignoring the principle of Archimedes and expects that boat to float. But if they followed the rules and they obeyed those principles, they're not scared that their boat is going to sink. They don't have to pray, God, please, I hope this thing floats. Did you observe the principles or not? Because it's pretty easy to track, yes, I did, or no, I didn't. You reap what you sow. My dad taught me another thing about uh, reaping this principle. He said, you reap later and greater. Later and greater. Uh, my, my first uh, pass at gardening, I don't remember where I got the seeds because I was too cheap to buy anything. They must have gave them out at school or something. But I got a pack of, of seeds for cucumbers. And I went behind our shed when I was a little kid. Remember those little metal sheds with the doors that you had to like tear yourself apart to get the things closed? Well, in the back of the shed... I pulled out the grass and I raked the dirt around with a rock and took the seeds and just <laughs> covered them up. I don't think I watered them or anything. I just created a little ditch through the seeds in, covered them up, and walked away. Well, a few weeks later, my mom called and said, uh, Son, do you, did you plant something behind the shed? I don't know. <laughs> We, went, we walked back out there, and, and it was as if we were watching a science fiction feature. There was this, the cucumber that ate the shed going on. It was just massive. 
I thought, I cannot possibly be responsible for this because what I put in the ground was just these little tiny seeds. Man, this could not be associated with what I did. You reap later and greater. Now, uh, the, the later part is tough because we, we want immediate gratification, and, and that discourages people from doing the right thing. But the greater, that can be tough too. You see, sometimes we, we do things and it seemed like a small thing. But once it got into the ground and started growing and producing, it was way bigger than we ever thought it was going to be. Kind of like words that come out of our mouth. We say something to somebody without really thinking it through and we hurt them. We, we break their heart with just words. We, we discourage them from a relationship with us. Sometimes we discourage them from, from a relationship with God. Sometimes we talk people out of, of reconciliation with, with somebody else because we were careless with our words. You, you reap what you sow. These principles are in place so that we might be able to survive in this world Every one of us are responsible or irresponsible, and we're going to reap either the benefit or the burden. So we use this principle recognizing that it's connected to our future. Now, you reap benefit from sowing good. Now, Courtney tried to tell me that shouldn't that be well? Shouldn't it be sowing well? Sowing well? I don't want to care about grammatical. I'm using good as a noun. <laughs> Bear with me, I'm from Kentucky. Um, you reap benefit when you sow good, as in when you do good. We connect people to Jesus. I have said for years that there is nothing that we can do that looks more like Jesus than finding a need and meeting it. You reap benefit when you sow good. When you invest in the lives of other people, it is so worth the effort. Is there an area of your life where you find that you know, you're just unsatisfied? You, you, you aren't happy with, with what's going on, and you, you'd like things to be different. I, I think there's something that, that has to happen. We have to have a little conversation with herself, and ask, what is my life producing? What, what is my life producing? Now, hopefully your answer just isn't a paycheck. Hopefully you can find something that's going on in your life that pays it forward, that, it, that invests in somebody other than you. But when you look and you see there, hey, there are things going on in my home, in my finances, in, in, in my job. I just wish these circumstances were different. Then, okay, well, then what's your part? If I don't like this situation that I found myself in, what is my role in, in, this, in this little party? Because the news is the only path you can change is yours. You, you, you can have all kinds of advice for somebody else. You can, you can listen to their story for, for five minutes and tell them three quick steps to, to correct everything that's wrong in their life. But whether or not they do it, it's up to them. If you want something to be different in your world, you change you. What is my part in this situation? You know, if you don't like how things are going in your home, what are you doing to invest in it? You know, my kids are disconnected, and, and I don't feel like I've got a great relationship with them. Okay, are, are, are you available? Are you pouring into them? Do you pursue them? Do you go after them? Uh, um, my, my kids are grown, and I am a text message stalker dad. I text message them something. Sometimes I'm just trying to gather information or encourage them, and if I don't get a response in, I don't know, like two or three <clears throat> days, um, I copy the message and paste and send and paste and send and paste and send and paste and send. And eventually I'll get a phone call, dad, 
<laughs> what do you need? <laughs> I don't know. I thought you could read. I sent you what I needed. <clears throat> My kids feel pursued. <laughs> Sometimes they feel annoyed. But they need to know that I want to know what's going on in the world. Do you have a situation in your world that isn't what you'd like it to be? Then how about we leverage this principle of sowing and reaping for your good? I'm going to reap benefit because I'm going to sow good into this world. All these kind of point to a culmination in verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now this is like the crescendo uh, of chapter 6. It's taking all the stuff that was said before it and saying, don't give up on it. Look at these first eight verses. In verse 1, there's a call for compassion toward the broken. In verses 2 through 5, there's encouragement to to serve each other without losing our sense of personal responsibility. Verse 6, there's a call to respond to the teacher. Verses 7 and 8 is the explanation of of sowing and reaping. This this wisdom principle teaches us that we plant in our lives in general, we will harvest so, so what are all these things? What's the connectivity? What, what do they have to do with each other? And what do they have to do with doing good to all people? Well, caring for the broken, personal responsibility, honoring a teacher, sowing and reaping, all these things are invitational. They're, they're an invitation for us to get in the game and make a difference. The broken invite our compassion. Our relationships invite us to sacrifice. The teacher invites us to respond to the message. Sowing and reaping invite us to live in wisdom and maturity. It's all about invitation. Every story in Scripture, as a matter of fact, every story that reveals a person in love with God always begins with an invitation to make the most of the time and resources that you have been given. God invites Moses to steward his life toward freedom. Esther was invited to live in such a time as as this. Daniel was invited to to live a, a different kind of life in the presence of his captor. Solomon was invited to choose what was best. Jesus asked Peter the invitation in a question, Do you love me? Paul was invited to give up his ambitions to pursue deeper, real, meaningful ones. The entire uh, 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews shows story after story of people who lived radical lives in order that God's life might be revealed. You see, when you live a life of radical obedience, it gets noticed. People see what's going on in your world, and they, they... I remember going to my hometown a few years after um, I I went into ministry and I ran into a guy I played basketball with. And uh, uh, he said, so what are you doing now? I'm a youth minister. He's like, no, seriously, really. (laughs) What what are you doing now? I'm I'm a pastor. Really, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I'm like, it's, it's the story of God in our life. All the stupid stuff that everybody knows you used to be involved in, it gets to become a launching. It's a platform for how in the world did that happen? It goes on and on. God uses time as an invitation, and the invitation goes out to you and me. The question is, do you hear the invitation? All this background... Uh, was to give you context for my life verse. One little verse that I I keep coming back to. One little verse, certainly not the most important theological verse in the Bible, but it's the one verse that keeps me pointed to Jesus. It keeps me checking my motives. It keeps me centered. Therefore, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all people, especially 
to those who belong to the family of believers. You see, time is, is an opportunity. And, and actually, in our text, it is quite literally. Because in verse 9, let us not grow weary for in, uh, let's not become weary in doing good for at the proper time. <clears throat> Your Greek lesson for the day. Uh, the word translated time uh, here in verse 9 is, is a Greek word called keros. There are two Greek words for time. Chronos, you got to watch. It's the measured time, hours, minutes, seconds, days, weeks, years. Chronos, time. Keros is translated opportunity in verse 10. Same exact word. Because it paints the right picture. Some people call uh, the right moment a, a teachable moment. Some people call it a carpe diem, you know, seize the day. This opportunity presents itself. It's now. Now is the time. Do you see life like that? As, as this opportunity that's poised in front of you? A, a, a chance that is making people uh, available to hear the good news that you have fallen in love with? I, I guess you have to ask yourself a question. Are we paying attention to the world that we live in? Now, I don't know about you, but it, it seems to me that the world is kind of a mess. That there's a lot going on that seems to, to separate us and divide us. And, and that's just not what God is calling us to. There's supposed to be this, this bond of unity that helps us point people in the right direction, that we can see each other as, as family, that we can take care of each other's needs, that we care more about other people than we care about ourselves. And when we see time as precious moments, as opportunities to see good in this world and enhance it, we'll live in a different world. The question is, what will we respond, how will we respond to God's invitation? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we're grateful that you uh, position us to do great things. Not just good, not nice, great things. And Lord, sometimes we are so focused on our stuff, our problems, our situation, my advancement, my success, that we completely ignore you and the call that you have on our life. And so God, I pray that here in this place, as we look at your word and its call to us to do good in your name, Father, would you help us to change our mind about what's important, and to put you back in first place, that, Father, we might be able to love you and serve you. We want to make a difference, Lord. Make it in our hearts so that we can share it in our homes, so that we can take it to the streets. We want to lift up Jesus, and we ask for strength in doing this, and we pray it in his name. Amen. So our next step is pretty simple. It's like getting the game. That's your next step. Get in the game. Now, there's all kinds of ways uh, to get in the game here at MCC. We have ministry opportunities that are abounding. And the reason for that isn't that we think we're going to identify all the needs in the world and do something about them right here at 1146 East Central Avenue. <clears throat> we're trying to create an appetite in the hearts of believers. And so we have all these things, and there are ways to get involved. Helping Hands. It's a food pantry uh, downtown. Uh, it, it, it needs some help. Uh, on Wednesdays, a truck comes in, and it needs to be unloaded. And some of it needs to go in a refrigerator, and some of it needs to go in a shelf. And some of the people who are doing that work are, are senior citizens who have restrictions on how much they can lift. 
maybe you, maybe that's you. You can make a difference. Threads, uh, a clothing ministry, there's sorting and, and clients that, that need somebody to bring boxes. Some of the coolest conversations I have had have been in bringing somebody a tub of shirts and just talking to them, hearing their story, listening to what's going on in the world. You, you want to make a difference? Meet a need. The Phil of Grace Farm, Ed and Betsy Epperson have a farm out on Upper River Road. And uh, Ed has his business there, and he's got this big farm. And you know the silliest thing? All the stuff that he grows, he gives away. <laughs> and he partners with MCC to be able to do that. Now, I'm looking out, and I see some of you who I've been uh, around a table cutting potatoes, and maybe you've been out there helping to harvest, but he needs help. Uh, find him on Facebook, Phil of Grace Farm. Like the page, and you'll get messages on when they're getting ready to do something in the evenings. Our kitchen team meets right over here behind this door, right by the American flag. And they prepare meals, and they put them in the freezer so that when people have issues, surgery, death, you know, they just need something. We're able to respond to that need. Do you like to cook? They're looking for people who... And this was given to me. So that we need to find somebody who, who just likes to clean. <coughs> Freak. <coughs> <coughs> I mean, maybe, maybe those people exist. Maybe, maybe that's you. If you're sitting beside that person, just send them back over here. You like what you like. I want to ask you to use it. Children's ministry. Right now, there are a lot of kids down these halls uh, learning who Jesus is. Well, they, they could use some volunteers. Now, I'm not asking for somebody with a pulse. I'm asking for somebody with a passion. Do you love kids? Then you need to talk to Jason or Michelle or Susan and go through the process because there's a process. We check out who you are and we make sure that you're safe to be with our kids. But is that who you are? You need to be back there serving, loving kids. This is just some of them. And there are people in the back who can answer questions today. So you'll have to walk past somebody like this if you don't want to do anything. But if you want to get in the game, go find them. Ask your question. See, here's the thing. The world that we live in is messed up. My, my phone vibrated while I was behind this curtain, and I pulled it out to see maybe it was my wife, and it wasn't. It was a text message uh, notification that three more police officers have been shot and killed. This world needs good. Please, will you not leave the same way you came today? Will you please be the voice of Jesus in a world that is so messed up? Please. Take a step today. And it doesn't sound spiritual. That's okay. Trust me. Get in the game. Start doing something that lifts other people above you, and you will find that your heart will change because of what your hands have done. God works that way. Obey. Do. Because the transformation... That's his. And he is faithful. He will shape you and make you look like his son. Do something. Take a step today. Do 